Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about today, the title of my paper is Ufana Lomina Umunto Mnyama, or The Untranslatability of Blackness. I'm going to come at some point to what, what that, uh, the first part of my title translates to in English. So at the start of the 20th century in what is now South Africa, the language of a periodical often belied the geographic location from which it emanated or in which its editors hoped it would be most widely read. Of course, in many ways, this continues today. Language often articulated and continues to articulate the boundaries that separated out what one might call uh, black people into linguistic or ethnic groups, be it Swana, Zulu, Kosa, or otherwise. In 1922, Magema Fuse published the first book by a native Zulu speaker, Abantu Abamyama Lapa Bavela Ngakona, The Black People and From Whence They Came. But the different words that marked and continued to mark in many ways racial identity in different languages did not always carry their meaning across the various vernaculars. Sometimes Abantu Abamyama referred to black, breed, Zulu, or Kosa people. Other times Abantu Nsundu in languages such as what would become Afrikaans, Zvart Menza, Clearing, or Brown, were the terms that were used. So not only did black people speak different languages, but that language difference was sometimes used to pass out one black self from another in the face of unstable racial categories and alliances. The story of the appearance of these terms as racial identities in local indigenous vernaculars is not only one of simply putting one word in place of another, in my instance for today, in Tsundu in place of Nyama. It is also a tale of how an awareness of a global blackness with all of its fault lines entered local and indigenous languages in the South African instance, and how many made race as identity and belonging in their mother tongues. It is the story of blackness as a mo modern site of experience, be it of oppression, displacement, rehoming, belonging, joy, difference, and much more. Here, I want to speak somewhat about how translation, the attempt thereof, or the inability to, became and becomes a point of entry into blackness as a global and local identity construct. So if we take the terms Ntsundu and Nyama, Ntsundu means quite literally brown, the color brown, while Nyama had come to mean by the 19th century black, I offer these two in Zulu rather than in English in order to emphasize that the debate was not necessarily about which racial category someone like Magema Fuse or his readers belonged to as much as which vernacular color. It's the movement from quite literally color as thought of in terms of a color palette towards a vernacular term to best describe the collective that people were attempting to convene. I do so because it is not the composition of the group that changes for someone like Fuse when he uses Ntsundu versus Nyama. Rather, the difference between the two in the case of Fuse seems, resu seems to result from internal pressure on one hand from Zulu readers and other Nguni groups, because there's a Nguni language as well as Zulu, as well as external pressure in the form of the awareness of and the emergence of a global dimension to the collective to which he understands himself to belong. So by 1922, Magema Fuse, who fought for the term Abantunsundu as a definitive term for his people uh, in 1890, by 1922, he titles his book Abantu Abmyama. As Flonipa Mokwene contends, these two facts need to be reconciled. Why does Fuse reject the term in 1890, but adopt it in 1922? In 1890, Fuse defended the continued reservation of the term Omyama for the praises of the Zulu king. By 1922, however, he turns to it as a way to mark the group he seeks to document in his book. Fuse is about to turn on the question of the Zulu terminology for blackness as racial and cultural identity was not unique. As different Zulu and Kosa periodicals from the end of the 19th century to the early 20th century demonstrate, 
The dawn, that the dawn of the 20th century brought not only what Du Bois called the problem of the color line, but also the problem of how to name the political, cultural, and social communities such a dawning awareness of that problem necessitated. Who was not white enough to belong may have been one question, but another borne out was what to call those who did belong, how to make them visible in language. As South Africa, as a political and socioeconomic being, as a political and socioeconomic entity came into being, bringing with it labor conscription to the mines, farms, and domestic work, along with connection and contact with people of color from elsewhere, the terms used in Nguni languages increasingly, or the term increasingly, became Nyama. In his 2003 book, The Practice of Diaspora, Brent Hayes Edwards offers a theory of diaspora in relation to the African diaspora and black experience more generally, claiming that articulating difference, not just linguistic difference, but more broadly the trace or the residue perhaps of what resists or escapes translation is what he's interested in deploying the term diaspora for. Edwards re reads against the grain of Leopold Senghor's claim that the difference between US and African blacks is more slight, involving a simple decalage in time and in space. Rather for Edwards, decalage comes to represent that which cannot be either dismissed or pulled out. Though he offers a translation of the term as gap, discrepancy, time lag, or interval, he keeps the term in French, resistant to crossing over. So I'm going to quote um, an extended passage from him. Uh, the verb calé means uh, to prop up or wedge something, as when one leg on a table is uneven. So décalage in its etymological sense refers to the removal of such an added proper wedge. Décalage indicates the reestablishment of a prior unevenness or diversity. It alludes to the taking away of something that was added in the first place, something artificial, a stone or piece of wood that served to fill some gap or to rectify some imbalance. This black diasporic decalage among African Americans and Africans then is not simply geographic distance, nor difference in evolution or consciousness. Rather, decalage is the kernel of precisely that which cannot be transferred or exchanged. The received biases that refuse to pass over when one crosses the water. It is a hanging core of difference. It is the work of differences within unity an unidentifiable point that is incessantly touched and fingered and pressed. His question is, is it possible to rethink the workings of race and the cultures of black internationalism through a model of décalage? The question for me, however, is how does décalage help us to understand the ways in which blackness was deployed in the decade leading up to the Union of South Africa and possible global political dimensions of etymologies of local indigenous terms of self-identification by people who come to be known as Abantu Abamyama, resident in South Africa at the time, and how that continues on to the present. Can décalage, with its particular claims about blackness, language, and translation as differences within unity, help us understand different eruptions of blackness, or what Michelle Wright calls epiphenomena of blackness? If we look at the exchange between the police and the leaders of the protesting miners in Marikana in 2012, if the first, the video could come up. Do I have to? So if you just hit. Here we go. How do I copy? It's like they want to remind everybody, including the police, that in a democracy, workers negotiate with the employers. The police should not be this shield between employees' rights and employers' obligations. The very interesting part about
So this ex in this exchange, what we're hearing are the miners uh, speak of the heartache, abuflungu, that they feel when speaking, seeing black police officers like them blocking their path to the small hill where they will eventually be massacred. Ufana lomina, one leader says, umuntu miyama, you are like me, you are a black person. If we go to Mary Sibande's Sophie series, which I have two backwards, yes. Sibande's series depicts black female subjectivity post-apartheid, but with all of the legacies of apartheid woven in, black female subjectivity in beauty and in labor. Now, if on one hand the miners represent the kind of commodification and production of black masculinity in South Africa through mining labor and conscription, the Sophie sp series speaks to the layered production of black female subject making in the process of commodification into domestic labor. So if you look at uh, both figures, that Blue, the, the, what, uh, that's Mary Sabande who's created, she created resins of herself. And what's actually being worn is uh, a uniform turned into a ball gown. So a typical domestic worker's uniform turned into a ball gown. And the colors are quite particular, that blue, uh, you will see either in older versions, apartheid versions of domestic workers' uniforms, as well as in African uh, African authored churches, so things like the Zion Christian Church. So on one hand, what we have here with these is a kind of inherently a set of particularly particular genres of being black to what we now call South Africa, the minor and the domestic worker. At the same time, these are modes of being that were, from their inception, transnational. Mining labor and domestic labor often comes from, came from, outside of South Africa as much as from within its borders. These modes of being are birthed in relation to conscripted black labor within what becomes a tight national framework of South Africa, but also we know that this happens outside of South Africa. My question then is how do we translate these, can we translate these as both subje subjectivities and experiences that speak to the global order of racial capital while also recognizing the very untranslatability of the particularities out of which they emerge? What does it mean to move from Abantu Abumyama to states of blackness? I'll leave it there. <laughs>